I give a lot of talks to very, very technical groups about semantic web and ontologies and data and algorithms and all this. So I'm really looking forward to um, taking a different tact on this one and, and starting it with a photograph. This is a photograph I, I took. Any thoughts about what it stimulates for you? Why? Why? Why did they build that there? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I was going to say out of context. Out of context. That's great. Actually, so, so this, that's great. Let me go to another one. Something similar, something kind of out of context. What, what I kind of discovered in my photography is that I really like um, things that are kind of out of context. And I think that one of the things that's interesting about photography is that you've got this little frame of the composition of the camera that tells a story about what's inside the frame, but it also leaves open a whole bunch of stories about what's outside. And I realize that it's probably part of what I like about data too, which is that when you see a photograph, we don't know anything about the broader context. And I think that data acts like that too. When we look at data, we know that what we're looking at, those points, are real and they're valuable. But they're often decontextualized because there's a lot of data in the world. And so we have this challenge of being able to understand how the piece we're seeing fits into some, some bigger piece. One of the things I really enjoy about photographs like this is that they don't explain everything. They get the gears turning in your mind and you start trying to figure out what is the context. You start making up a story. And what I'm interested in when it comes to software is how do we get software that also gets the wheels turning in people's minds. So these are things that I think are beautiful. This is something else I think is beautiful. And to me, it feels kind of related. This is a bunch of data and a diagram of how it's all connected. Here's another form of data. Does anybody know what this is? Yeah, HTML, right? You know, this is what your computer sees when it shows you a web page. How about this? This is also data. Any guesses what this is? This is also a web page. And there's big pieces of content. There's lists of little lists items that are connected. And what, what I love about this is that when we see a web page, this is what we see. When your web browser sees a web page, this is what it sees. And you always hear about Google crawlers, right? They're crawling the web. OK, well, this is what the Google crawler sees. It lands on the page, and then it looks left and right, and it looks for the yummy bits. So there's lots of orthogonal views into the same thing. Where I'm going with this is the thing I was talking about, about photographs that can get the gears turning in your mind, and then examples of data that can kind of get the gears turning in your mind. What, what I'm interested in is how can software and technology help people have good ideas. So that's a little bit about, you know, that's, that's the high level view of my company. I was kind of last night thinking about how I was going to explain my company to your company. So I went on the web and said, well, let's, let's look at Feinstein Keen and, you know, how do you guys describe what you do in a couple sentences? And it was great. It was great because I saw, you know, the intersection of transformative technologies and transformative ideas. Uh, multiple trends and technologies converging uh, to change the landscape and those changes uh, you know, massive, massive changes for life sciences and research. And I said, that's going to be my presentation outline. So we're going to go through those three things about intersection of ideas. So feathers. There's a reason I named my company Exaptive. What an exaptation means is something that started out for one purpose, got serendipitously co-opted for another purpose, and ended up thriving there. Okay, so feathers originally started because they kept animals warm. They trapped a lot of air. Feathers were a lot more like fur initially. Now, if you're an animal and you trap a lot of air and a predator chases you off a cliff, um, you might not die, right? So anybody that's seen a duck fly knows that feathers don't mean you're good at flight, right? <laughs> and then if you get chased off a cliff and you don't die, then maybe you get to have babies, and then a few generations later, you soar. This is exactly how evolution works. You can trust me. I'm from MIT. It's, it's, just, like, it's just like this. So, you know, so at Exaptive, as I became convinced that this, this biological phenomenon, by which things that start out for one reason get co-opted for another set of reasons, I, I became convinced that that's really a really good cognitive model of how insight happens. That we take something that we, we know in one domain, and we have these aha moments, and we realize how suddenly, oh, that, that actually applies in this other domain. I can leverage it there. And I became so fascinated by that, I, I, I named the company Exaptive um, because we want to create software that helps people exapt ideas from one area to, to another. And let me show you what I mean by this. There's a guy named uh, Martin Wattenberg, who's a great data visualization guy. He likes music, and he wanted to be able to find a way to uh, visualize the structure of a piece of music. So 
He created a computer algorithm, which was based on something called a suffix tree. So he's exacting something that's very kind of technical from computer science. And he's using it in this music domain to be able to take a piece of music, decompose it into its notes, and then draw uh, arcs. This is called an arc diagram between kind of repeated refrains or, or combinations. This gets really fun when you look at lots of different types of music. This is Madonna, like a prayer. This is Bach and the three Goldberg variations. So if you take a classical music appreciation class and you hear about like A, A, B, B structure, call and refrain and themes, you can actually see right that, that happening here. Um, Clementine looks like a folk song. It kind of goes around and around and around and around. Um, Schoenberg, whose goal is to make music that has no repetition, would probably be very upset at seeing that, <laughs> that, little, that little blob there. Right Now I'll show you this other piece of music. There's a piece in here that I find interesting. There's a repetition from here to here. Inside that repetition is another repetition. Inside that repetition is another repetition. You can, you can see that. I don't know what that means. But here's the thing that's, that's cool. It's that if you take music and you decompose it into its notes, you get a big, long string of letters, right? Like A and C and G. And that starts looking a lot like something else. DNA. This is not a piece of music. This is a gene se as an RNA sequence that's been visualized with an arc diagram. And, and we can look at that now, and we don't necessarily know. This is you know, getting the gears churning. You know, we don't know how we're going to cure something from this. But we suddenly have some new places to look and some new kind of cognitive tools with which to, to think about it. In 2010 or 2011, when I was thinking about Exaptive, I wanted to start this company. There was a conference at the Broad. This is Martin Wattenberg who, in, who invented this. And after he presented it, there was this big connection. All the geneticists ran up to the microphone afterwards and they said, go back to that music thing. That, you call it music, but I call it what I do for a living. Can, can I use that to look at my gene sequences? And, and the answer was, well, unless your, your text sequences look like MIDI music files, the, ans <laughs> the answer is no. So there was all this excitement, but it couldn't really go anywhere. And, and I said, boy, that's, that's a shame. Because the next time geneticists get excited about something and say, can I blank, the answer better be yes. Right? <laughs> so the point of that is, you know, sometimes these acceptations don't work. Sometimes they do. Gutenberg invented the printing press after he went to a vineyard and saw a wine press. And I think it's just awesome. You look mechanically how similar they look. Spaceship One, first commercial spaceship that won the X Prize to go into space and come back, was based on a very innovative feathering tail design, which was modeled after a Batman shuttlecock. There's this guy, Jonathan Cache, that got in touch with me just, just a couple weeks ago after he saw a webinar of mine, and he said, let me tell you about my PhD. I took zebrafish, and I watched how they swam. So this is a healthy zebrafish swimming around on the bottom, you know. And then I gave them drugs. So this is your zebrafish. <laughs> And this is your zebrafish on drugs. This is your zebrafish on LSD. This is your zebrafish on ecstasy. This is um, your zebrafish on morphine and morphine withdrawal. This gives me a totally new view of why cigarettes are hard to break. This is your zebrafish on nicotine. Okay? And he said, boy, these, these signals are so different that I should be able to show a computer my zebrafish, and it should be able to tell me what drug my zebrafish is on. And that was a really hard machine learning problem, and he couldn't really figure out how to do it until a year later, by luck, he entered a Google search that showed him a group of guys in Switzerland that were looking at how hurricanes move and were trying to figure out something about the nature of the storm based on the erratic movement of the hurricane. So this is, and, and they ended up working together and, and using those algorithms. It's great ex, kind of modern day acceptation. Going back to this where this didn't work, you know, I. I I like being at the intersection of transformative things too, but like, I live in Inman Square. There's a big intersection there. It's a mess, right? <laughs> like just being at the intersection is not what you want to do, right? You want to you be conducting traffic through the intersection. So, so you know, what, what I'm interested in, and I think you guys are too, is how do we, how do we make these uh, intersections, possible intersections, how do we actually make them connect like the zebrafish and, and the hurricane? You know, what I see as a vision for doing that is using new technologies that are converging. So it kind of feeds right into the second point on your, on your guys' website. But we've got a lot, new, a lot more tools now um, around data. So I think data is a great, a great thing. And data are not what data used to be, right? This, this is, I think most people, you ask them to think about data, they think of an Excel spreadsheet. That data are increasingly coming in the form of a graph as opposed to a spreadsheet. A graph is just the mathematical term 
for circles, and they're called edges, so nodes and edges. But it's a way that you represent something and its relationship to something else. And I think that as we move forward in, with technology, that we're going to move away from a row and column uh, view of data, and we're going to move towards a graph view of data. And so that's something you know, on the technical side of things, if you guys take away, I think this is a, is a key concept. Things are starting to look like data that never looked like data before. Right? So let me, let me play this, this video here. This is an application we built at Exaptive, a little proof of concept, and it involves words. So we can build a synonym tree. We can pick certain words and we can look at the synonyms of those words. We can go into a dictionary and, uh, or a thesaurus and we can look at the synonyms this way. Sorry, it's a little, it's a little fuzzy. That's different. That's different than looking at co-locations. So co-locations are, if you give me a word, what other words show up? If you give me a word like new, the co-location could be York or it could be improved. It means two totally different things, right? So that's co-locations. But here's a, here's a neat algorithm. So what if we want to create an algorithm that goes out to a data set, a, a big database, huge database actually, and tries to figure out something about social connotations and associations for words. So we're going to pick a couple words, liberal, free, and independent. We're going to run this algorithm and it's going to start bringing back um, the cultural American connotations and associations with those words. And, you know, so this starts to come in and actually we can actually look by female and male where they are. And that's the reason we can do this is that this isn't a database. This is Amazon Mechanical Turk. You, and I, if you don't know about Mechanical Turk, what it is is it's a crowdsourcing tool. So we click that button, we take those words, we send them out to, um, to this crowdsource environment and we ask people all over America to tell us what they associate with those words. And in real time, we bring it back and we display it in a word cloud like this. So to someone using this, they don't have to know what's behind the scenes. They don't know if it's a database or if it's an algorithm or if it's a simulation or if it's, you know, 20 million people getting paid a dime to do something really, really quickly. And that really kind of shows what I think is this convergence between humans and computers, between data and people trying to do things with the data. There's this spectrum that exists of a human-computer interaction. On one end of the spectrum, we have pure creativity. So that's no room for computers. That's, in my opinion, writing good poetry. I'm sure there are computers that write poetry, but I don't think they do it very well. Yeah. So just take the computers out. On the other end, you have pure automation. So microsecond stock trading. You don't want a trader trying to make any decisions about that. Let the computer do it. No room for people. What I'm interested in, and so what, what my company focuses on, is this interesting space in the middle, which is a symbiotic collaboration between the people and the technology. And that is the area where you need to have the cognitive gears turning in the people, and that needs to be augmented with all the capabilities that the, that the computer can provide. And I call this, this phenomenon the cognitive hourglass. And I think that if you look at the type of tasks that occupy this middle position, what you see is that you start with a whole bunch of information. You don't really know necessarily what you're looking for. You narrow in on something. You see something interesting. You broaden out. You narrow in. You broaden out. And, and where technology plays a key role is that at each one of these inflection points, you need to have different tools and techniques to be able to do that process. It might be an algorithm. It might be some more data. It might be a visualization. And, um, and to the extent that computers can help with this sort of cognitive process, I think, I think this is what paves the way for a completely new type of human-computer interaction. So let me show you an example. So here's an application we built that looks at studies for multiple sclerosis. This, this circle represents a study by Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And inside that study are a bunch of people. Think, think of these like patients, 413 patients. Now, patients with MS may participate in lots of studies. And there's a lot of power in seeing where the same patient has been in multiple studies because you get a more comprehensive view of the disease. So when we bring in the green study, what we see is there are some patients that were only in the green study. There were some patients that were only in the red study. But this is, this is the exciting part. There's a group of patients that were in both studies. And what's important about the, uh, these data is that these studies were not a coordinated effort. Right? This is part of what Accelerated Cure Project does, is they facilitate studies across institutions in a way that leverages, that maximizes the chances of overlap. Now, it maximizes overlap, but it hasn't had, up till now, a way to communicate that overlap to the various uh, uncoordinated, 
principal investigators. So you can see once we, we bring this out, we can start to look at these study stacks. And where that gets exciting is in the next video. So cognitive hourglass, I've got lots of things to choose from. It's broad. Let's narrow in. Let's look at uh, one particular institution, Beth Israel. OK, now let's start to broaden out again. So maybe I want to look at another, another institution like Glycomines. And I continue broadening. Let's add Pfizer. I continue broadening. Let's add SUNY Upstate Medical University. Let's let these guys duke it out to figure out where they want to sit. Um, and we start getting these kind of complicated overlaps. So I can, I can broaden out again. Oh, OK, now what I want to do is narrow in, right? This starts to get too hard. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop this. And now I'm going to go and find, I've picked five different organizations. Can I now go in here? Now I'm in the narrow part of the hourglass. Can I find one group that has all five results? That's one set of patients that have been studied by all five of those institutions. If you zoom into that, you've got a medical center, for-profit institution, big pharma, a university, uh, a trust, philanthropic trust, right? These are five organizations that would never really think to necessarily collaborate. But in a certain way, they, they, they have. It's been a serendipitous virtual collaboration that they don't know about. But what if we could take this, click on this, send an email to those principal investigators, and create a real physical collaboration out of something that started as a serendipitous virtual collaboration? That's, that's what I get exceptionally excited about. So here's the things that you know, I'm hoping you guys kind of took away from each of these. This idea of exaptation and that it's not just a biological model. It's a, it's a cognitive model. What data are, are changing, it's, it's a graph, not just a spreadsheet. But you need to think about how those tools fit within this larger cognitive process. And that it's not just about connecting the dots. This is literally connecting the dots. But it's about, it's about connecting the people that are behind those dots. So if you guys read the abstract that I sent out, I promised some inflammatory remarks. So I'll kind of close with that. I talked about connecting people, right? It's not just connecting the dots. It's connecting the people that are behind the dots. We have lots of technologies for connecting people. We have these virtual cities with lots of people. For Facebook, it's like between 500 million and a billion people that are all crammed into a tiny fiber optic cable. And they can commute anywhere in 32 milliseconds, which is how long it takes packets to move around the internet. And the thing about it, if you think about it like a city, then you say, OK, well, what do cities do? Because I think. We've proven technologically that we can create these large-scale social networks very quickly and, and make them very large. But I think we haven't really shown what they're good for. They're certainly good for selling advertising. They're certainly good for sharing pictures. Um, and don't get me wrong, like I, there's a use for all, all of those things. But, but what, I, what I'm personally passionate about is what's the best use for getting lots and lots of people packed in one place? And that's generating ideas. That's what cities do. If you look at the number of patents that come out of cities, you double the size of a city, you don't get twice as many patents. You actually get 2.15 times as many patents. That's by Jeffrey West, who gave a TED talk about it. The reason they generate ideas like this is, is because everyone in those cities has their own cognitive hourglass. Right? And it's not just one person wrestling with a problem. Right? It's all these other people in close proximity with this big jumble of all of these cognitive hourglasses. And so what we're really passionate about at Exaptive is how can we funnel these processes that are going on in this virtual environment to generate, generate these ideas. Now, we don't get this everywhere. And I think the reason we don't get this is that social networks are inherently different than work networks. The Dalai Lama is on Google+. And when he says something, it ripples through to, to all of these other people. And that's, that's fantastic. Steve Jobs, when he says something, it ripples through. Most of these people do not like Steve Jobs. They do not want to share photos with him. They don't want to necessarily hang out on the weekends. It's not a social network in the same way that, that most of the use of Facebook and Twitter are. And in terms of LinkedIn, what I would say is that, that talking about work and actually doing work together are two different things. So what I think is we need to move not just from social networks to work networks, but what do work networks produce? They produce ideas. We really need to think about how we create uh, cognitive networks. So when I was thinking about this, how many, do you guys know who Jane Jacobs is by any chance? So Jane Jacobs wrote a book called The Death and, uh, the Death and Life of Great American Cities. She was writing about the exodus of people to the suburbs and, and really mourning the loss 
of a lot of that kind of friction of all those cognitive hourglasses that would happen in sidewalk cafes and things like this in the city. And when I read this book and I was thinking about it in this context, I realized, you know, Facebook and Twitter, these are, here's my inflammatory remarks, I would say they're not virtual cities. They're virtual suburbs, right? They're where you can go and you can hang out and you can share your pictures and you can talk. But what we need is a virtual city where people can come in from the virtual suburbs, they can work, they can get tired, and then they can go back and tweet and share pictures about their day. She's no longer with us. She passed away on, on April 25th, 2006, which ironically was the day that, that Zuckerberg was testifying that, that the idea for Facebook was 100% his. What I'd like to do is create something that, uh, that is a very, very large and dense city, but one that, that works very, very well. I, I spent a year living in Calcutta, India. I love India, but India is not producing twice as many patents as New York City. It's just, it's just not. And you run into lots of problems when you have certain population density issues and infrastructure issues. And what's exciting to me about the technology that's converging now is that we have the opportunity to create virtual cities, I call them cognitive cities, where we can get all the benefits of what cities do best around idea generation, but we don't have to deal with all the physical problems of actually creating those cities. So this is a little pie in the sky. I want to make this a little bit more concrete. This is a video, this is a, a tool that we put together that is a builder of data-centric applications. I drop components into here. As I connect them, or as I drop them in, they show up here as these dynamic web pages. Different sections of code in different languages, and I can wire them all together. So this is what we're gonna do now. We're gonna kind of wire this application. This is an input box to a search, to a word cloud. And what this means is now I type in brain, it searches PubMed for all of the research on brain. It gives me a word cloud. If I want to make this interactive, I just wire something back up. And now I have this interactive word cloud with PubMed. Here's why I'm showing you this. It's not, it's not just because this is you know, fun in terms of navigating PubMed. It's that this set of connections is a graph. Remember I was saying that data is not just rows and columns, it's a graph. This is a graph. And a city is a graph, right? It's a bunch of people that are connected through different things. We tend to think of applications as things that work on data. There are these black boxes where you put data in, you get some data out. <coughs> what we're proposing at Exaptive is to think of the application as data itself. So when you build this application, you could build this using components that got submitted by different people, just like Wikipedia has things that are submitted, different people submit different pages. And then the act of a smart person putting them together in a meaningful way builds a network it's not just a software network, it's not just an application network, but it's a subject matter expert network. It's a data resource network. It's a visualization technique network. So that when someone drops in something about zebrafish, the system can say, hey, do you know that Jonathan Cachet, who was looking at zebrafish, he got a lot of value out of hurricanes. People that look at urban traffic maybe get connected to people that are looking at communication traffic, right? So, so this is the very tangible manifestation technologically of how we think we can create this, this cognitive city. And in the cognitive city, this would let you do some very mind-bending things when you're, not, when you're not constrained with physicality. It would allow you to take a population of people that are connected through different dimensions. They're connected because of shared data sets or shared algorithms or shared visualization techniques and project from that multi-dimensional city a whole set of orthogonal city maps. So these are all projections, right? So in the virtual city, if we don't have physicality, what does the roadmap look like? I think that's a really interesting question. And the answer is there is no one roadmap, right? You wanna, you wanna look at the city from one perspective, these people might be far apart. But if you look at them in another perspective, they might all, they might all clump together. And the reason these are orthogonal is because here's your transit systems. There's always a way to get, to get from one to the other, right? Some might be uphill, some might be downhill, it's not always easy. That's like a real city. So this is the vision we have, and um, this is what we're working on, and, and anybody you know, who wants to help us with it or be thought partners should feel free to get in touch. Thank you.